Welcome back, uh, NPTEL students, for week six. Uh, this is almost the middle of the semester for NPTEL course. Uh, so we're going to look at a very, very important and um, exciting topic in that sense uh, called anonymization. Uh, we look at importance of anonymization. Why do we need anonymization? Uh, different methods to do uh, anonymization called K-anonymity, L-diversity, T-closeness, and uh, differential privacy. That's what we'll cover uh, for week six. So just to do a quick recap, given that it's the middle of the uh, semester, uh, so uh, what have we covered until now? Right. So we, we start off with uh, uh, what is privacy. These are basically the uh, text uh, that I took from the first slide that I have, something like this. And I put it together here. Uh, so we started the semester with what is privacy, why study privacy, fair information practices, uh, OECD guidelines, FTC guidelines, and then right to privacy, we saw uh, um, uh, paper, Brandon's paper, uh, contextual integrity, um, Helen's paper, uh, Helen's work on it. Then we looked at what is privacy policy, what are the different components of privacy policy, uh, then privacy enhancing technologies, privacy invasive technologies, uh, social media privacy, a little bit of um, uh, Facebook uh, privacy settings, all of that. Then identity resolution, uh, privacy nudges, cookies, and last uh, uh, week we saw cookies and ethics uh, and institutional review board. So that's the topics that we have covered until now. It's a quite a lot of a topics, uh, but I but I hope that you are you're kind of getting a um, hang of all these topics. How does this uh, privacy uh, come together? Uh, what is the complication in actually studying privacy? Also, it's a it's a heavily a multidisciplinary problem, multidisciplinary topic. Uh, it needs an understanding of different aspects of how things are being done. And as always, if you have any questions for any topics that we're covering in any of these weeks, uh, feel free to post it on our mailing list. Again, I will try and do uh, some sessions uh, for, for students to just join and then ask, uh, clarify questions. And I'm also thinking of actually doing some interactions with the students uh, if, you, if, you ha if you're doing the projects that uh, I said uh, or if you're doing uh, the activity and you wanted some discussion, we can do that too. Okay, so anonymization. The the word anonymization, I'm sure you dictionary meaning you can you can understand that anonymization is to find a way by which you can suppress some data uh, and share it with uh, uh, people as and when you're sharing. What was the motivation of anonymization becoming an important topic, right? Uh, important topic uh, at different levels uh, in terms of uh, uh, methods that you can do, in terms of companies getting worried about it, in terms of institutions uh, looking at it as an important topic of research, all of that. Uh, so here is one very, sort of say, uh, important event that happened which helped uh, anonymization also to become more and more popular uh, more popular is this a world search data leak I, I put the link uh, for you to get more details there but here is what happened in a world uh, search data leak in August 2006 650,000 users and 20 million search keywords for three months, AOL released. AOL is this uh, American online company, which, which, is the, which is the company which used to actually have uh, give internet access in the initial days. Uh, and they also had other services in which search was one of them. And uh, they shared 650 users' data, uh, 20 million search records for three months. Uh, they made this public on August 4th. On August 7th, 2006, the data was taken down. Within three days, lots of things happened. And I'll tell you some of the things that happened, uh, so which will actually motivate the problem of why anonymization is important. AOL did not identify the users. When they made the data public, they did not have the data, uh, they did not have details of, let's take users uh, like PK on it, where somebody could identify that this was PK search results. 
API uh, of of users were uh, in the data. Personally identifiable information was in the data, right? So there there was some data that was there, which could be used to re-identify users. New York Times re-identify users, uh, cross-referencing other sources, including phone book listing. This was an important article. Uh, in the next slide, I have the link to the article also, which which is uh, uh, which is the first article which talked about re-identifying people from this AOL data that was made public. So when when AOL got to know about this, that uh, users could be re-identified from the data, uh, they took the data down. But interestingly, many copies of the data was already uh, circulated. I'm sure if you search for the data now, you would get some copies of this data lying around somewhere on the internet. And this particular AOL search data that was made uh, public uh, is actually listed as one of the 101 dumbest moments in business ever. Right? So that's the level of impact that this AOL search uh, uh, data that was made public had. And by now you would have realized what ended up happening, right? We uh, there is there is some data about searches. What all search that PK did? What all search you did? This is in this database. Uh, by using external information, you could actually uh, re-identify people in the search in the database. That's what happened. This is the New York Times uh, article. Uh, that's a link to the article. The article is uh, Faces Exposed for AOL Search. This is the search uh, uh, user um, from the database. And they were able to make this user data public, and they identified this user. And the article was written about this user itself because the user also consented into talking about our data. Uh, so some parts of it would be interesting for us to know uh, from the article also what, what kind of thing that came out, right? Uh, buried in a list of 20 million web searches, queries collected by AOL and recently uh, released on the internet uh, is user four zero user number four four one seven seven nine four nine. The number was assigned by the company to protect the search's anonymity, but it was not much as of a shield, right? So what did what did uh, AOL try to do? AOL basically removed PK's name and then they replaced it with this number, hoping that that number may not be re-identified uh, as a PK. Number X conducted hundreds of searches over a three-month period of topics ranging from numb fingers to 60 single men to dog that urinates on everything. Just the different types of searches that uh, the user had done. And search by search, click by click, the uh, identity of AOL user became easier to discern. There are queries of landscapes in uh, uh, Lilburn, GA, several people with the last name Arnold, and homes sold in Shadow Lake subdivision location, Georgia. Just giving out details of what are the searches that was done. It did not take much investigation to follow that data trail of uh, Thelma Arnold. That's the user uh, 4417749 that they re-identified. Arnold, a 62-year-old widow who lives in Lilburn. You can see the connection of Lilburn here and Lilburn here. Uh, frequently, researchers are friends' medical uh, ailments and loves her three dogs. Those are my searches. I think that's the reason why this user was made public is because the user also consented into talking about her. Um, I, I let you read the whole article. I just pulled up some some parts of it for uh, for conversation in the class. In, uh, in the privacy of her four-bedroom home, Ms. Arnold searched for the answers to scores of life's question, big and small. How could she buy uh, school supplies for Iraq children? What is the safest place to live? What is the best season to vis visit Italy? And of course, that's her with her dog. Our searches are a catalog of intentions, curiosity, anxieties, and uh, questions. 
and you would also realize we've been i mean in uh, the first first week of the class we saw social dilemma uh, and uh, gray tack all that right which is clearly this uh, search results that we're talking about here can be re-identified who you are and if if facebook's and twitter's knows about it they're able to use this better for for your search results for your recommendation all of personalization and everything and this is 2006 please keep in mind there was a day in May, for example, when she typed termites, then T for good health, then mature living all within few hours. Her queries mirrored, million, mirrored millions of those captured in AOL's databases, which reveal the concerns of expe uh, expectant mothers. So this is basically arguing that what other data that uh, uh, AOL search results had expectant mothers, cancer patients, college students, and music lovers. User number 2178 searches for food uh, to avoid when uh, breastfeeding. Number this seeks guidance on calorie counting. Number X searches for the songs time after time. Right. So essentially, they're just arguing about different users. But they re-identified only uh, Telma, so therefore that's uh, the, most of the uh, information is about Telma. Right. So that just gives you a sense of what, what happened with uh, AOL, right? Here is another example. N this one was with the Netflix price. So I'm sure all of you are watching Netflix. Uh, the, the goal here was Netflix said that, look, we have a recommendation system right for ratings of the users using the ratings of the users we can figure out what recommendations to provide can you come and tell us what better recommendations can we actually do right. again pointer i've put for the netflix price but here are some details so this is collaborative filtering. So the, the, the goal was collaborative filtering algorithm to predict user rating for films based on previous ratings without any other information. The goal was I could give you user rating uh, of uh, users rating of movies, of the movies that I watched in the past. So can you tell us that what, what rating the user would give for this particular movie, right? User, movie, date of rating, and rating. That's what was shared. So this this is the key here what data was shared and this was an open challenge right this was netflix was saying that look we're doing okay but we wanted our uh, filtering process our recommendation process to be better please come and help us actually in, in, in a sense these are very good methods uh, for finding out new solutions in another word called as also mass collaboration, you can think of it, challenges, all that. What did they do? They gave training data for 100 million, testing data for 2.8 million uh, rows, uh, and, and uh, deleting ratings, inserting alternative ratings and dates, and modified rating dates. They, when they shared the data, this is what they did. They deleted some ratings, inserted alternative ratings. Let's take PK saw a movie, uh, movie um, a rating, he gave it as three, uh, but they changed it to five. And uh, date of the rating that was, let's take number 2021, they changed it to, uh, let's take, October 2021 and modifying rating date also. Source code plus description should be submitted and then they set it up in a, in a nice way that they could actually, uh, I mean today I think you do it on Kaggle, there are many platforms uh, that you could you could do this but again remember this was 2006 again. So uh, source code and description to be submitted and there was a jury that they had. Uh, the jury would decide who was the winner and they were actually having these kind of leaderboards uh, to show who was doing well in the metrics that they had. Interesting, right? Interesting for Netflix to do all this. Uh, s started uh, 2006 and until uh, 2007, uh, June 2007, 20,000 entries were submitted. That's, and, and everybody got interested about this. And, and this was, a, I think, a million dollar price. Right? So there was money attached to it. So people were actually trying to uh, find uh, a better mechanism for, for this rating. What happened was 
so arvind narayanan now at princeton and earlier at uh, uh university of texas at austin what he said was look this data is publicly available can you just go find out who are in this data why because the user the the data that is shared is this user movie rating so can you just re identify this particular user uh who said but who's the user who's giving the rating same problem as uh, AOL uh where re identification of the user was happening that's what they tried so the paper that they wrote the paper is public i'll show you the paper in a second uh, robust de anonymization of large data set how to break anonymity of the netflix price uh, data set this paper uh, became very popular and arvin uh, is doing arvin is continuing to do uh, work in in the space of privacy cryptocurrency all of that yeah so this is the paper on uh, Netflix price. So I'm going to make this sheet uh, uh, one one PDF file with all the papers public, so you should be able to get it. So this is the paper. Uh, so this is what they did. Uh, we apply our de-anonymization methodology to the Netflix price data, which contains anonymous movie ratings of 50,000 subscribers, 500,000 subscribers of Netflix, the world's largest online movie rental service. I think that statement is still true. Uh, Netflix is probably the largest rental service right now too. Uh, we demonstrate that an adversary who knows only a little bit uh, ab about an individual subscriber can easily identify the subscriber's record in the data set using the internet movie database as a source of background knowledge uh, we successfully identified netflix records of known users uncovering their apparent political preferences and other potential sensitive information so this is um the the uh, imdb database that uh, you may be aware of but if not please go take a look at it uh, this is all movies ratings that are available with the with the with the cast with the storyline uh, with uh, reviews of users everything so imdb uh, and, and the data is also public that you can actually analyze it Right. So they use IMDb data with the Netflix uh, publicly made data, and then re-identified users, political affiliations, and sensitive information. So that's what they did. Today, I'm sure when you when you think about it, it's probably possible because we have seen these kind of attacks that has happened. We have seen users re-identified in other uh, platforms and uh, um, context also. But again, going back to 2006, it was it was pretty pretty novel. All right, so that's the paper. I just highlighted some parts that we can, we, I, I'll show it. So, so the question that they were interested in asking in, in uh, looking at this Netflix data was, how much does the user adversary need to know about a Netflix subscriber in order to identify a record in the data set and thus learn our complete movie view viewing history? So the goal is that how much, and so for example, right? Uh, meaning, uh, we should we should actually do an activity. For example, one of the activity that I uh, like uh, doing in my class, uh, the the class that I teach at Triple I D Hyderabad, is that I would ask them to go find my cell number, for example. Right, my cell number online. I will. I, let's let's do this activity, right? Why don't Why don't you also try? Um, finding out my cell number, finding out my date of birth, uh, finding out any of these kinds of uh, Aadhaar card, PAN card number, any sensitive information about me, and if you find it, please send it to me. Hopefully, you'll send it only to me and not to the mailing list, uh, right? Uh, so, so it'll be why? Why is this interesting? Because you'll actually be able to use supplement some information. And now that you know, I'm a faculty at Tupelo de Hyderabad. Now that you know that I also teach computer science, I, I my area of interest is privacy. I live in Hyderabad. Earlier, I used to live in Delhi. All this information that is available, you could actually use to find more information about me. So that's the question, right? How much do you need? How much of this information is necessary to go find out that it's actually PK instead of some professor in Hyderabad, let's take. Right. Does privacy, actually this, this one was also an interesting question because does movie rating even matter, right? 
I mean, I I kind of rate some movies. Uh, I kind of rate some uh, hotels that I visit. It does not even matter with in terms of re-identifying me and how does it affect, right? The privacy question: Does privacy of uh, uh, Netflix ratings matter? The privacy question is not: Does the average Netflix subscriber care about privacy of his movie rating, movie viewing history? But are there any Netflix subscribers whose privacy can be compromised by analyzing the Netflix privacy data set? Right. So uh, essentially, the the question is. Uh, can can you actually find out some users' details from this data set that's made public, which can be which can be pretty damaging for that particular user? When we look at K anonymity, I'll show you some interesting things that Latanya did, where uh, she kind of got hold of uh, a governor's personally identifiable information, sensitive information, which helped to actually highlight the problem also, right? Because I think when when you um, when you look at uh, when you want to make these kind of topics more accessible to people, finding out information about popular uh, celebrities, popular people, will help actually people understand the the generic people, the general citizen to understand the problem also better. Because otherwise, it's an it's an academic exercise, right? So one or two more lines at the end. So our de-anonymization algorithm works under very general assumptions about the distribution from which the data are drawn. One of the other critical things that you want to also keep in mind is about this distribution uh, um, uh, that uh, of the population, right? So if you have taken statistics, um, quickly statistics, this is population, this is sample, right? Can you actually derive a sample size from a distribution which is representing the population? Right? Population could be 40% female, 60% male, uh, or, or employees of a company, 30% uh, undergraduates, 40% postgraduates, and 20% uh, PhDs, if that distribution is there. If you do a study of the company, can you get the samples which are very similar to the uh, population itself? Right. So that's the question. That's uh, that's the point that is made here. Our de-anonymization algorithms works under very general assumptions about the distribution from which the data are drawn, and is robust to perturbation and sanitize sanitization. Perturbation, sanitization, and metri methods by which you can actually change change, so to say, cells in the data and make the data more uh, anonymous. Therefore, we expect that it can be successfully used against any large data set containing anonymous multidimensional records such as individual transactions, preferences, and so on. An interesting topic for future research is extracting social relationships, networks, and clusters from the anonymous records. I think this is a very, very interesting point this, this paper makes, and I made a note that uh, this would uh, connect to Indiana University study, uh, which, which a paper called Social Fishing. Just do a search for uh, title Social Fishing and Marcus Jacobson. You'll get a paper which looked at. Uh, so this is the paper that we looked at even in the uh, IRB last week's content, where we talked about uh, a study uh, where they collected uh, social information and then send out an email uh, to to a participant as though it is coming from somebody they are connected with. Right? In the ethical IRB section, I showed you one slide which which was this complicated uh, data collection that they did an email sent out. That's the study uh, I'm referring back again here. Uh, Social Fishing title, Indiana University and Marcus Jacobson. So they be, th this, this is saying that future research in, is extracting social relationships and seeing how vulnerable they are, how anonymous uh, people can be in this. Uh, social phishing actually does it to show that if you uh, send out phishing emails as though it's coming from people that I'm already connected with, there's a high probability that I will actually click on the links. Okay, so that's about that's about uh, Netflix price uh, uh, privacy concern. These are just motivation for doing anonymization. 
different methods for anonymization, k-anonymity, diversity, t-closeness, differential privacy. There are many, many methods for anonymization. I'm sure if you look at the literature, uh, there'll be uh, many, many techniques. I will focus on some of them because these are also slightly more important and has gained a lot of attention over a period of time. Uh, so these may be important for you to know, to know the spectrum of what are the anonymization methods. De-identification, de first one is this whole idea done by Latonia Sweeney. Um, where where she took medical records and which she took water records, put them together, and de-identified people. Right? Medical records uh, uh, had all these details: uh, ethnicity, visit day, diagnosis, procedure, medication, total charge, zip, uh, birth date, and gender. Name, address, date registered, party affiliation, date last voted, zip birth date and gender was again available in the voter ID list. And both of this data she was able to collect it either publicly or sending a request to uh, um, uh, government agency saying that I would like this data and they gave this data for uh, Latanya to do this analysis. Again, if there's if there's of any interest to you, you should figure out, uh, you should uh, try and understand how this could be done uh, in 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 the Indian context itself. So look at uh, how you can put some data together that's either publicly available, or uh, you you can curate it from online sources and put them together to re-identify people. K anonymity was a phenomenal work at that point in time because this was the first method uh, which looked at how to actually uh, anonymize the data set when you're making the data public. And the goal for anonymization is is that you want to share the data for, I mean, I think from week one, I've been motivating this, right? You want to share some uh, data more publicly and uh, uh, yeah, more publicly or to an uh, analytics company or to a startup. You want to make sure that uh, they don't infer anything from the data that you're make, giving it to them, or at least they don't identify users. One method is suppression. Uh, replace individual attribute with a star. I mean, this could be anything. Star is just an example. Uh, the other method is generalization, which is replacing individual uh, attributes, uh, individual attributes with a broader category. Which is, if let's take, if one's weight is 45 kgs, instead of suppressing it to with an asterisk, you make it that oh, the weight is between 40 and 50 kgs. So now you, whoever gets access to the data, they can't really infer that uh, what exactly my weight is. They would be able to only infer saying it's between 40 and 50. Here's one uh, table uh, which gives you an example uh, of what suppression, what uh, generalization you can actually do in this data. Right, so if you if you look at uh, the data that you can, that's a table which is first name, last name, age, and cost is um, uh, the four columns that are in the data. I just took the cost just to make it more sensitive. So here, if you see, if you want to do suppression, you can say that uh, first name for the first row I will suppress the first name, uh, for the second row I will suppress the last name and age and cost. Third row I will suppress the first name. Uh, for the last name, uh, for the fourth row, I will surprise last name, uh, age, and uh, cast again. What does this do? This just makes it the row one and row three to be exactly the same, and row two and row four to be exactly the same. So now the point is that if you get access to this data, you just will not be able to identify which is actually Raj Sharma versus which is Manish Sharma. Similarly, which is Shishti Rawat versus which is Shishti Kaur. Right, so that's the that's the idea here. I hope you're getting the idea. Uh, suppression metric method. So the the uh, idea here is that it is called two anonymized with suppression, which is uh, two rows uh, are very identical. 
row 1 and row 3, row 2 and row 4 are identical. Every cell can be suppressed with an asterisk, but data will be uh, useless. I mean, one of the arguments that you can make is that, look, why do we even worry about finding these methods? Just make asterisks for all of them, right? Uh, making asterisks for all of them, the problem is that, okay, good, the, nobody's, uh, nobody will be identified from this, uh, but the problem is that you just can't do anything with the data also. Uh, cost of doing is uh, number of um, stars that you have to put. The, the cost of actually doing this anonymization is, is about just getting the number of asterisks and uh, the suppression, how many do you have to do, right? So that's the cost. Let's take if you have a million rows, and if you have to do this uh, uh, for like 10, uh, 10 columns, how many places do you have to put asterisks, and how do you decide which asterisks to put, where to put the asterisks? Fewer cells suppressed to provide k-anonymity. The goal for k-anonymity was, look, I want to reduce, I want to use the data, I want to make the least number of stars in the cells, but the data should be very useful for anybody whoever is accessing using that data. That's the k-anonymity goal. Here's another example uh, of two anonymized uh, um, data itself. So again, left in the row, it says birth date, uh, birthday, gender, and zip code, very similar to what Lathania had. Uh, now you can actually suppress one row in this, which is get rid of this row, third row, and then make the group one and group two, uh, which is by making only the date of uh, birth date in the first two rows as star, and the zip code, uh, last four digits in the zip code as uh, stars again. So the US zip code is a five digit number. Uh, so it is suppressed here with four digits, this one, and then in group two, it is suppressed as these three. Only the last two digits are suppressed here. And now you will not be able to re-identify uh, people, uh, differentiate between these two users and differentiate between these two users. That's what K-anonymity's goal was. Okay, hope, hope that is sinking in. Okay, let's look at what k-anonymity paper was quickly. So this is the k-anonymity paper that Latania had, and some of it is, uh, you'll see, we have already seen in the slides. So the this paper talks about k-anonymity, a model for protecting privacy. How can a data, bro data holder release a version of its private data with the scientific guarantees that the individuals who are the subjects of this data cannot be re-identified while the data remain practically useful? That's the goal. A release provides k-anonymity protection if the information of each person contained in this release cannot be distinguished from at least k minus one individuals whose information also appears in this release, which is the two anonymized where at least two rows are very similar, which is two anonymized meaning the second part of the sentence if you see, uh, a two anonymization protection if the information for each person contained in the release cannot be distinguished from k minus one, which is one individuals whose information also appears in the release. In the Sharma example that I gave, in the group one, group two example that I showed, you will not be able to identify, uh, distinguish between these two users in the row. That's the idea for two anonymization. If that was three anonymization, similarly three rows would be there, you will not be able to identify, distinguish between three, pe three rows in the data. So some more details of uh, what she actually ended up doing, uh, which is which is actually pretty exciting uh, method that she followed. Uh, it will be nice for you also to think about if you can redo, try some things in Indian context. 
so uh, this one reads as uh, re-identification re by linking. Uh, National Association of Health Data Organizations reported that 37 states in the U.S. has legislative mandates to collect hospital-level data, and 17 states have started collecting ambulatory care data from hospitals, physician offices, uh, clinics and so forth. So essentially giving a background saying that look there are states which have to collect some of these health records. And the health record contains uh, zip code, birth date, gender, ethnicity also. Uh, in uh, Massachusetts uh, the Group Insurance Commission uh, is responsible for purchasing health insurance for state employees. GIC collected patient-specific data with nearly 100 attributes uh, per encounter along the lines of those shown in the leftmost uh, circle of the figure one, which is what I showed you in the slide also for approximately 135,000 uh, state employees and their families. Because the data were believed to be anonymous, GIC gave a copy of the data to researchers and sold a copy uh, to industry also. So this is basically the uh, circle that is on the, on the left hand side, uh, which is what uh, GIC provided. For $20, I, which is Lathania, purchased the voter uh, registration uh, list from Cambridge uh, and received the information on two uh, disks. Those days, disks were the only way data was shared, so she got two days. Actually, you can also do this even even uh, these days now. I, I did a couple of uh, uh, data like this uh, from from few cities uh, in the U.S. by sending some requests and actually collecting this data, looking at the data. The rightmost circle, which is how I have already shown in figure one, shows that the data included the name, address, zip code, uh, birth date, and gender of each voter. That's this one. Okay. How did Lathania's work become? Again, it's a it's an academic work at MIT. Uh, it's a PhD level work. She was just doing this research. How did this work become very attractive to others? Is because of this this paragraph. This paragraph here. For example. William Weld was governor of uh, MA at that time and his medical records were in the GIC data because he was a governor because he was so if you look at it this GIC uh, it's saying that the government employees data has to be part of the data that is uh, GIC has. Governor Well lived in uh, Cambridge according to the Cambridge voter list six people had his particular birth date and only three of them were men and he was the only one in the five uh, in his five digit uh, zip code right zip code again like our pin code uh, people uh, live in all these uh, pin codes the argument that is made here is that the governor uh, who is male and who's uh, a cambridge voter list he was part of cambridge uh, voter list and uh, people uh, had his birth date six people had his uh, 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 particular birth date and only three of them are men, and he was the only one living in the five-digit uh, five zip code. The other could be in uh, Cambridge uh, living, but in other, other zip codes of Cambridge. You can think about whatever city you're from. Uh, the pin codes are very different, uh, meaning few kilometers, few uh, areas are uh, distributed into these pin codes. If the pin code is different, you, you will not be able to identify that person again. If you're the only one living in that pin code, for example, if you're the only one, uh, f uh, if you have to re-identify a person like this, if you're the only one student uh, or if you're the only female student taking this class, uh, sitting in, uh, let's take uh, uh, Chennai, Kolathur, uh, with the zip code of uh, Ananagar, uh, some are Tinagar, some uh, zip code, it is very evident that it's just you, right? That's what was done here. 
Um, so I think this paper is slightly philosophical also. Uh, this this part is more like computer security is not a privacy protection. It argues that while access control and authentication protections can safeguard against uh, direct disclosures, they do not address disclosures based on inferences that can be drawn from the release data. The argument here Lathania is making is that difference between what a security is and what a privacy is. And I wrote the CIAU is uh, uh, how security is uh, taught in fundamental security classes, uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and then U is uh, usability, uh, which is what security is generally talked about, whereas privacy is, look, the data is shared, confidentiality is provided, integrity is there, data was given, data was re received the same way it was actually sent. And availability is there. The data is provided uh, if you need at any given point in time. But you know what? Data can be broken. Data can be actually uh, re de identified just because uh, we can use outside information uh, to de identify users. So one critical thing, two two uh, critical things. I think uh, when you have to do when you have to implement K anonymity uh, in in a data, just think about it, right? You're working on uh, let's take a company where the company wants to release data, or you're 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 from your college and your college wants to actually release the data of all the marks that the students got for some research projects for some companies to do some analysis and give it. Uh, you have to identify two things, which is what anonymity do you want to do, which is this K value, right? Which is this K value. Second, you have to identify is what columns do you want to suppress? That's what this quasi identifier is, which is to say that, look, let V be the voter specific table described in earlier in figure one as the voters list. A quasi identifier for V written QV is name, address, zip code, birth date, and gender, which is the columns that you want to actually anonymize are the quasi identifiers that you want to actually uh, look at. The more the quasi-identifier is, the more you want to keep the K, the more the cost of anonymization is. Right. So you, yeah. So that's how you decide which column to anonymize, and what anonymity do you want to keep? How many people do you are you okay with being re-identified in the data? What level of protection are you planning to give with the data? So that's that's what is defined here. Let RT be a table and QIRT be the quasi identifier associated with it. RT is set to satisfy K anonymity if and only if each sequence of values in RT uh, QIRT appears with at least K occurrences, which I've already shown you examples of two. Just formalizing the whole thing. Uh, this is the example of uh, uh, K anonymity again. Uh, where k is equal to 2 and the columns are race, birth date, gender, zip, and the problem uh, is, is on the last column. Uh, if you look at it, you will not be able to identify uh, people from this uh, table. So here is an argument that it can be trivially proven that if released data RT satisfies k anonymity with respect to quasi identifiers. Again, keep in mind the key is this quasi identifier because I think that's what controls because if you pick the right quasi identifiers, then the anonymity can be very, very powerful. QIPT, then the combination of the release data RT and the external sources uh, on which QIPT was based cannot link to Q link on QIPT or a subset of its attributes to match fewer uh, than K individuals. This property holds provided that all attributes in the released uh, table RT, which are uh, ex Internally available in in combination, blah blah blah. All that. So essentially, it is arguing that you want to make sure that you you are carefully identifying the uh, quasi identifier. So you also want to think about how K anonymity can be. Uh, at least the paper argues about how K anonymity can be. Uh, attacks can be against K anonymity. So one of the attacks, so let me, let's go through the attacks. So one uh, attack is unsorted matching attacks against K anonymity. Uh, so one of this is position of the table can help identify also, right? So this is uh, uh, if, if the rows in the table are in particular order and the columns of the tables are provided in a particular order 
and there's also this temporal uh, attack that uh, that K anonymity also talks about, which is you release the data now and you release the data sometime later. If the K anonymity is not kept in mind, what was the data released before? It could have some concerns. It could be it could be re-identified. It could be used to uh, re-identify data in the K anonymized data set also. Yeah, this is complementary in the previous release uh, attack against K-anonymity, which is in the previous example. All the attributes were in the quasi identifier That's typically not the case. Uh, it is more common that the attributes that constitute the quasi identifier are themselves a subset of attributes of released. As a result, when a table T, which adheres to K-anonymity, is released, it should be considered as joining other external information. Therefore, subsequent releases of the same uh, privately held information must consider all the released attributes of T uh, uh, quasi identified to prohibit linking of T unless, of course, subsequent releases are based on T. Right. Essentially, if the data set was released with the four column, columns as quasi identifier, you want to continue using those four columns and beyond as quasi identifiers when you release data future in future. temporal attack which builds on that also. So that's what k anonymity is. Uh, let's go back to the slides. Uh, lack of diversity in uh, sensitive attributes. So here are the three limitations of uh, the uh, k anonymity methods itself. Lack of diversity in sensitive data, right? The columns if you see problem uh, in the paper. If the columns are not very diverse, if the values in the uh, cells are not diverse, right, then there's a problem. Users can be de-identified. Background knowledge, supplement knowledge, right, which is I know that you live in Ananagar makes me, I know that you live in Gachiboli in Hyderabad can be used to de-identify people in the rows also. Subsequent release of the same data set, I just told you that uh, a future release of the data set should be uh, made sure that the earlier uh, data quasi identifiers are kept in mind while the data is made public. So those are the limitations of uh, <coughs> K-anonymity. Let's continue on the other methods that I mentioned before, uh, L-diversity, T-closeness, and differential privacy. So this is uh, L diversity. The idea here is that if you remember the uh, quasi identifier and K anonymity and the last column being problem, we saw a column, right? Where the diversity in that particular column was actually lesser. So the idea that L diversity was arguing is that sensitive attributes must be diverse within the each quasi identifier equivalent cell. What does that mean? That means in this, in this, uh, quasi identifier class, which is uh, the disease, flu, shingles, acne, there's diversity there, right? That's what makes the L diversity better. K anonymity, this was not the case. Right. We'll see more details. I'm, I'm going to give you more details. We'll look at the paper also uh, to, get, to get you uh, more understanding of this. So another example here, which if you just look at it here, it's heart disease, viral infection, cancer. So every class, if you think, if you take this as one class, each class, every class is diverse enough that identifying the, identifying the rows in them will be actually much harder. That's L diversity. So this is the paper of, for L diversity. Let's look at the paper. So that will give you more uh, details of, uh, of the algorithm, of the methods, everything. So that's L diversity, the, the paper, L diversity, privacy beyond K anonymity. And then the algorithms that I'm, I'm, I'm walking you through also is built temporally. First K anonymity came and then L diversity. Uh, so therefore the papers are also kind of arguing about uh, the prior methods. What, is, what was the goal and what did this paper show? 
First, we showed that an attacker can discover the values of sensitive attributes uh, when there is little diversity in those sensitive attributes. Examples of heart disease, cancer, flu, all that. Second, attackers often have background knowledge and we show that K-anonymity does not guarantee privacy against attackers using background knowledge. This background knowledge is what I said uh, earlier also that look, I, I know that you live in this zip code, I know that you're, you're a male, I know that you must be aged between 40 and 45. Let's take if I, my, my home was next to you or if you're in my class. All that information is background knowledge, additional information which can be used to actually do the attacks. Right. So here is a, a example, uh, again the same thing that I used in the slide. So this is 4K anonymous in, in inpatient microdata which is in K anonymity. If you see the diversity here is pretty low, that's the argument that uh, uh, this paper is making, look, I think we need to have more diversity in the um, in the uh, sensitive column which will make it more harder to uh, de-anonymize the data. Some, some interesting attacks that uh, if we, let, let's go through it uh, in slightly detail. So Alice and Bob are uh, antagonistic neighbors. Uh, one day, Bob falls hill uh, and is taken by ambulance uh, to the hospital. Having seen the ambulance, Alice, so please keep a watch, the background knowledge, all this will come. Uh, Alice sets out to discover what disease Bob is suffering from. Alice discovers the four anonymous table of current inpatient records, which is what I showed you right now, which is this. That's the table. Again, you will have access to the papers, so you're welcome. You, you can actually take it as uh, leisurely as you want to look at the details of the paper. And so she knows that one of the records in this table contains Bob's data. Since Alice is Bob's neighbor, she knows that Bob is a 31-year-old American male who lives in the zip code. Therefore, Alice knows that Bob's record uh, is uh, record number is 9, 10, 11, or 12. Right, so that's the um, that's the idea that she can figure out because he lives in uh, the zip code X and he's actually 31. So this one is less than 30. This one is greater than 40. Uh, this is this is within the uh, age group that she knows that he is 31. Uh, so he has to be in this class of uh, patients. That's the inference that she's making. Now, all those patients have the same medical conditions, cancer. So Alice concludes that uh, the Bob has cancers. Here is the next attack, which is background knowledge attack. Alice has a pen friend uh, named Umeko, who is admitted to the hospital as Bob, and whose patient records also appear on the table shown in uh, figure 2. Alice knows that Umeko is a 21-year-old Japanese female who currently lives in the zip code. 13068. Based on this information, Alice infers that Umeko's information is contained in the record 1, 2, 3, and 4. Without additional information, Alice, Alice is not sure whether Umeko caught a virus or a heart disease, right? So that's the same table. Uh, zip code is here uh, and, and heart disease and viral infection. However, it is well known that Japanese have an extremely low incidence of uh, heart disease. Therefore, Alice concludes with near certainty that Umeko has a viral infection. Right, that's the kind of uh, attacks that you can do in terms of K-anonymity, which is what the paper is arguing about. We also saw in the K-anonymity paper itself uh, different kinds of attacks that Latanya mentioned uh, what are possible. So what is what is L diversity arguing that it's better than K anonymity? L diversity principle is a Q block is L diverse, which is block as in the class, is L diverse if contains at least L well represented values for the sensitive attribute yes. A table L diverse if every Q block is L diverse. So essentially they're, they're, they would show that this example 
which is every row, uh, every column in the sensitive would be different, right? Would have uh, three categories here, viral, uh, heart disease and cancer, cancer, heart disease, viral, heart, viral, cancer. So if you go back to the earlier table, that kind of an attack, Alice knowing that uh, Bob is in this table and she could infer that he, uh, he has ca cancer, is just not possible. And the same example with Omicro also, that heart disease and viral infection is not possible because there's another uh, sensitive information. The probability is li slightly lower, that's all. Okay, I hope that's uh, making sense in terms of what uh, what is the expectation of L diversity is, how L diversity works. All right, so the paper, meaning you're, you're welcome to take a look at the paper, go in details of evaluation, uh, how they can actually, uh, empirically they show that L diversity is more stronger than K anonymity. Okay. So now, now if you look at L diversity itself, you can pause, pause the video for a second and think about what are the limitations of L diversity itself. So if you look at one of the limitations, values within one equivalence class may have semantic similarity. Even though the diversity may be there, but there is semantic similarity between the values is the concern that uh, T-closeness uh, researchers argued. What is that? So if you look at, let's take uh, this one. Right, so this is the original table. Again, this will show up in the paper, but this is the original table and the anonymized table is this um, with respect to uh, L diversity. Right, so this is three diverse. That's the original salary disease table. If you look at this, gastric ulcer and stomach cancer are both semantically similar to something relevant to uh, gastric problems. And therefore, an attacker can identify that, let's take if, uh, if a patient, if a friend is in this data, he or she could be re-identified. That's the problem that T-closeness was arguing for. Distribution of sensitive attributes within each quasi-identifier group should be close to their distribution in the entire original database. So the arguing, the argument that the T-closeness was making said, look, the, the diversity that we see in the table, right, the quasi-identifier group should be close to the distribution of the entire table itself, not just only the class of uh, rows that we are looking at. We'll see again in the in the paper. So that's the paper, which is T closeness uh, privacy again because of temporal. They are they're titled as T closeness privacy beyond K anonymity on L diversity. These are all phenomenally uh, influential papers. I would I meaning if if any of you are interested in this topic, uh, which is uh, uh, anonymization, feel free to read the paper and come back and we can discuss the paper in detail too. Here's what the paper is. So we can actually look at the paper quickly, some parts of the paper to generate some interest in you. Uh, so this is the T-closeness paper. In particular, it is uh, neither necessary nor sufficient to prevent attribute disclosure. We propose a novel privacy notion called T-closeness, which requires that the distribution of a sensitive attribute in any equivalence class is close to the distribution of the attribute in overall table. Right. So any class should be similar close to ev uh, entire table. That is, the distance between the two distributions should be no more than a threshold T. <clears throat> they would use the earth movers distance, uh, but a di some distance metric you can actually keep and you can say that the, the distance between these two, which is only the class and the uh, table itself, should be a s small value threshold T. Uh, so these are examples again to argue that uh, uh, K anonymity, uh, L diversity does not work. So this is again an example uh, where they showed that uh, semantically similar and therefore does it fails. Okay, so here is a T-closeness principle. An equivalence class 
is said to have T closeness if the distance between the distribution of the sensitive attribute in this class and the distance of the attribute in the whole table is no more than a threshold T. A table is said to have T closeness if all equivalence class of T closeness. The goal here is to measure the T closeness. That's what they would show how uh, T closeness is measured. But it's basically a distance metric that you can keep. You can, ke you can have uh, any distance metric that you are aware of and use that saying that the distance between the class and the table is small. Right, so they would they would do earth movers distance. Earth movers distance is is a distance where I, the initial uh, idea was if you had to put the thrash, uh, uh, it uh, gets accumulated. If you were to move one uh, thrash, uh, uh, so to say, hill, which is of some height, some shape to a different shape and a height, what is the distance it takes, right? So there are there are also Levinston distance, um, Jarrow-Winkler distance. There are many distance measures uh, which you can actually use for uh, the data that you have. Right. So here is what the um, uh, so the paper deals with the how the distance metrics uh, you you can measure, but here is one example that they argue that look it's the same uh, table. They they are saying that table table that has t closeness of this with respect to salary and x closeness of with with the di with the disease for the uh, for this table, and therefore it's more anonymous compared to the table that was given for k-anonymity and uh, l-diversity. And then the, again, the distance metric should be ca could be measured as, look, what is the, uh, come up with a metric for this, and how different is this from the whole table? That's a metric you want to measure. So again, this paper goes on to detail of uh, how uh, this m this metric is measured. They do some experiments to argue that uh, this t-closeness uh, method is more powerful than k-anonymity and l diversity. Okay, so hope you understood that. Uh, so from the uh, let's let's go back to the slides. All right. Uh, so we saw uh, k anonymity, L diversity, and t closeness. Now we'll see something more, something that probably is uh, relatable also. So if you if you've heard about uh, uh, Apple uh, using differential privacy, differential privacy is the next concept. Uh, the Apple products have now implemented differential privacy, and many other products, many other uh, platforms are also trying to find ways to implement differential privacy in it. So that's the idea, differential privacy. So this method again, I so for to so this this method was developed by Cynthia Dwork. Cynthia Dwork has a very short. I think this video is about uh, 16, 17 minutes. What I recommend doing is uh, take a look at this video, like you've seen the videos of uh, social uh, social dilemma, all of that. Watch this video and come back uh, and. Uh, uh, let's discuss uh, if you have any questions or something. And I have also pointed the paper. So the idea again is that uh, there is a formal mechanism by which they have they have uh, said that the anonymization is stronger than the earlier methods. And this has become differential privacy has become extremely popular because the implementation is uh, uh, has been going on in some of the products, and uh, popular services have started using it. So what we covered for week six, that's the content for week six. Week six is slightly dense. I'm going to keep it a little uh, shorter uh, for, this, for this week uh, because I, I, I'm, we can also do some uh, discussion around papers that you read, uh, the videos that you watch. Uh, so what we covered, why anonymize? It will uh, data leak, Netflix, uh, and uh, uh, methods for anonymization. We saw all these four methods. So again, thanks for attending uh, this 
take uh, listening to this lecture and if you have any questions feel free to drop it on the mailing list uh, I, I hope that the mailing list will uh, help in answering any of the questions that you may have.